We all know that we are material creatures, subject to the laws of physiology and physics, and not even the power of all our feelings combined can defeat those laws. All we can do is detest them. The age-old faith of lovers and poets in the power of love, stronger than death, that finis vitae sed non amoris is a lie, useless and not even funny. So, must one be resigned to being a clock that measures the passage of time, now out of order, now repaired, and whose mechanism generates despair and love as soon as its maker sets it going? Are we to grow used to the idea that every man relives ancient torments, which are all the more profound because they grow comic with repetition? That human existence should repeat itself, well and good, but that it should repeat itself like a hackneyed tune or a record a drunkard keeps playing as he feeds coins into the jukebox. Welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. This is David. And this is Nick. And today on this episode, we're reading Lem Solaris, which is another one of his sort of failed miscommunication-themed novels. Uh, it's definitely one of his uh, most read. It's certainly his most adapted to film. And uh, after having read this after Fiasco, which I think we determined in the last episode was kind of a fiasco of a novel in a lot of different ways, uh, Lem, yeah. Yeah, Lem presents uh, at least a more human story. It's it's focused more on oneself and kind of both miscommunication with alien life forms as well as just really not being able to communicate with what's going on inside. So I guess, David, to, you know, to start off, how, how does this shape up versus the, uh, we'll say, novel-length essay of Fiasco that we just read last time? Well, I, I think it, it matches up a lot better because of the things that you mentioned, because it has such a, such a human element to it. It's much more of a psychological novel. There's depth, there's character, there's a strong narrative that you can follow. Whether or not it's successful in its own right, is another question, but it's certainly more successful than Fiasco. I think you touched on a lot of the key elements of what makes it better already. But yeah, I mean, like the human element is is very real in this one. And I think that was like my first reaction starting to read this is like, holy shit, like when you put humans back into a novel about science fiction, you realize that <laughs> like that's important. That's important for a narrative. <laughs> that's important for plot. And I think there's a it's kind of a weird balance that Lem has in this book that struck me as a little bit funny, having read Fiasco and also having read some of his other books. Uh, his Master's Voice is another sort of failed communication type of novel. But like Lem still goes back into his leanings into creating this sort of academic, scientific, philosophical background. And he has, I think there's like three distinct passages in this book that really dig yeah. into that. And they're, they're almost like spliced in. It's almost like he wrote these as an outline or as a, like a scientific dissertation on what the theory <laughs> of this planet is. And then he wrote this just sort of very individual, uh, first person driven narrative. And then he just kind of pieced them together. So they kind of stick out like a sore thumb, but they're also kind of this cool, fun, like, backing and like setting for actually what's going on with this planet yeah and that's actually a thought i had and uh our friend mike who unfortunately couldn't join us today made a note that there is one in particular and i think it might be the first one the first sort of academic s sequence or section mm -hmm. it feels very much like a sci-fi borges where he he sort of breaks down these different theories the apocrypha the the theories about what solaris is what it does and had that sort of borgesian play of making something seem much more a part of a real world yeah and he even builds out i think one of my favorite parts about these passages is he would build them out into sort of social implications and and the reactions of people not not even just within like the scientific community but also like the impact in the theoretical, we'll call it the regular world, the earth world <laughs> with respect yeah. to Solaris. And there's this Are you like, thinking of the last one that's like the Solarists. Yeah. And like comparing, comparing the idea of contact with Solaris being similar to religion about how people 
have uh, just elevated this to a concept and to an idea. And it's not really it's not really about the thing anymore. It's really about like the the holiness, the sanctity of this idea instead of what the actual goal of it is. Yeah, which I think goes directly towards a lot of his main themes, which is this idea of needing something to connect to, even if you don't fully understand it. I, I think that's one of his points that he was kind of making with, um, so needing something to connect to, but when that thing is so impossible to connect to, you forget that the goal, I guess this is like kind of the grand summary, the goal was simply not contact, but the goal was doing something with that contact. But then when <laughs> when that contact is so impossible, then it sort of supersedes the goal in the first place and it becomes the end all be all. And so that kind of, you know, the idea with similar with like religion and whatnot is, is that things can be amplified in, in certain different ways and I guess misrepresented and, and sort of taken in different directions. And I, I love the parallel he does that there. And I guess to me, it was funny being drawn so much towards the academic sort of like segues and, and passages in there, which very much were very similar to Fiasco, albeit maybe <laughs> much more skillfully represented. Certainly condensed and certainly parsed out in, in a much more comfortable way as a reader. Yeah, they were they were tangible. They were in the correct lengths. They were, <laughs> you know, at least varying in their styles and whatnot. But I guess my question for you is those those still were like the smaller portion of the novel. So if we get back into just actually a first person narrative, you know, how did how did that come off to you? Well, first I think we can sort of carry that metaphor into the key relationship at the heart of the novel between Calvin and Rhea is how I'm pronouncing it. I like Rhea. Rhea? Okay. So yeah, I th I think you can sort of carry that metaphor of of desired contact, desired purpose with livable confusion, which <laughs> I think maybe maybe Lem is sort of talking about and certainly comes across that way at the end of the novel. This carry this that metaphor into the idea of love and the love relationship between two people. How how expectations are failed and how we sort of become com comfortable with what we have even though we don't understand it and have trouble communicating with that other self, that other person. Yes. Yeah, so you sort of, I like that term livable confusion. And I think there's a, there's a progress of thought in this novel. It focuses so much on Solaris itself and the ocean and what it means and, and sort of what it represents. And then he kind of shifts it back in like the remaining pages and, we can get to <clears throat> how everything actually wraps up. But the livable confusion thing, I think, is is an interesting way of putting it because it allows you to see that we sort of tune ourselves to the variables around us mm. and our, our communication, our interpretations are based around that. And there's this passage towards the end when he's basically realizing that he's going to go back to Earth. And I'll, I'll read a little bit of it where he goes, What did that word mean to me, Earth? I thought of the great bustling cities where I'd wander and lose myself, and I thought of them as I had thought of the ocean on the second or third night when I wanted to throw myself among the dark waves. I shall immerse myself among men. I shall be silent and attentive, an appreciative companion. There will be many acquaintances, friends, women, and perhaps even a wife. For a while, I shall have to make the conscious effort to smile, nod, stand, and perform the thousands of little gestures which constitute life on earth, and then those gestures will become reflexes again. And so like the livable confusion, I think also extends to this sort of, I guess, present, like your livable confusion is also dependent upon all of these little tiny subtleties and things that you tune yourself to. And after him trying to figure out and tune himself towards understanding Solaris, understanding the ocean, understanding contact, he is now faced with this problem of contact back with his own race with humans with his own planet and i think it's i don't know i think it's a, a good observation of like how we just move between problems and and try to parse through them and really 
the simplest problems that are in front of us are still problems and communication within that is still its own difficulty. It is, and, but it's something we settle into. And you see it through all the different scientists on the ship. They all, in one way or another, settle into their own little world, whether it's with the visitor that comes to greet them, whether it's this sort of resignation to just get trapped in this cycle of the visitor returning in one way or another. And I think there's something about that that's both funny and dark and depressing, which comes out in that quote, which um, I read at the beginning of the episode, that human existence should repeat itself well and good, but that it should repeat itself like a hackney tune or a record a drunkard keeps playing as he feeds coins into the jukebox. And that comes after talking about how we keep living the same thing over and over again. And I wonder if, what if anything does the novel or the narrative tell us about this sort of existence? Is it, is it just commenting on it? Is it just claiming it? Yeah, I mean, I, I love that passage that kind of wrapped things up because it, it definitely framed it for me. And like you said, the cycle of livable confusion. But for me, it's, it's almost like, you know, as, as a person who has certain levels of anxieties and whatnot, it, it, it's basically an acceptance of just the reality of there being problems with everything, you know, <laughs> and he, it's just sort of, it's, it's where do you shift, where do you shift the energy of that? And I think, um, you know, the, the thing that I had read about him realizing that he had to like tune himself back to earth after so long of trying to tune himself to Solaris and then kind of Lem commenting that, you know, it's just going to be another cycle. You're going to rewind the clock and you're just going to go through the pain of it once again. And, you know, I think, I think the cycles of memory are a huge, are a huge thing in this novel. And just the fact that we are, you know, we're a combination of the past and the, the stresses and the things that we've been through and that, you know, you just kind of, you're going around this loop and you're looking for this holy entity of contact. But in reality, you've both been making contact all along and you've never been making contact. (laughs) And so that's just, that's the conundrum is that we sort of, we sort of isolate ourselves in so many different ways. And you know, there's a <laughs> there's a little tagline when in one of the academic passages, I think there was a a joke that was made about all of the research and stuff into Solaris, and is basically how do you expect to communicate with the ocean when you can't even understand one another? And you could also just extend that to say when you can't even understand yourself. So yeah. I think we you know we just create these loops because you know, like you know, as cliche as it is, like, can you ever really understand yourself? Can you ever really understand another person? And I think that's kind of what Lem's trying to get at in this sort of post-World War II pop pop psychology mixed (laughs) in with some sort of hippie-ish ideological concepts wrapped in a sci-fi novel, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can see elements of that. And your quote reminded me of another one that says, we have no need of other worlds we need mirrors we don't know what to do with other worlds a single world our own suffices us but we can't accept it for what it is now that single world you can interpret that as earth and lem's sort of pessimistic view of (laughs) of exploring the cosmos or you can see that as that single world being the one that you have in in your life in yourself now i mean lem definitely drops like some awesome some awesome maxims throughout this thing. And I'll just read another one that kind of ties onto it. But, you know, uh, here he goes on to say that uh, man has gone out to explore other worlds and other civilizations without having explored his own labyrinth of dark passages and secret chambers and without finding what lies behind doorways that he himself has sealed. That quote totally gets into the, the idea that this is a psychological novel that we bury or hide our past and it, it will continue to resurface. Yeah. So do you think, um, so I love all like the concepts and stuff in this, right? But do you think it succeeds as a novel that pursues that idea? No, I think the maxims are there and you get bits and pieces of it played out in the novel, the way Kelvin behaves with Rhea. But I don't know if that's enough of a show 
you know, sometimes authors or writers or readers talk about showing and telling, and I don't know how successful this novel is at showing these concepts. It certainly is good at telling them. Yeah, and I was kind of thinking, I was kind of asking myself this question as I was as I was finishing up the book, which is, if I'm so into the concepts, if I'm so into a lot of the passages and and these like brief moments of philosophical clarity, like what's missing to actually have it being a truly moving thing? And maybe it's because I didn't I didn't feel any of the any of the tragedy of it. I didn't feel any of the emotions behind it. And I also just sort of wonder, maybe that's not Lem's bag. And his inclusion of those aspects actually made this readable. And I think it's one of the reasons why Solaris is just the book that people know by Lem when he's got like 20 other books. Because it is, it is at least in my experience of the probably half dozen that I've read, the one that like attempts the most to make that actual human connection through a narrative and through like the first person viewpoint and through, you know, things like love and death and, and memory. But I'm just not sure that like that's that's the thing that he excels at, I guess. Based on the two books I've read, I would say no. <laughs> so I'm going to trust you on that one. Outside of that, the narrative, especially that human emotional connection between Kelvin and Ray doesn't feel developed enough. And I don't see the beginning to the end for them. It's not clear in my mind how exactly they got started, why they were in love. Right. We're just told that that's what they are, but you don't see it. You don't feel it in any way. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah, it's a tricky thing, right? I, I always, I always think it's sort of, um, sort of a question like, who are we to say why this person wrote it in this manner, which I guess is the whole idea of reading books and, and some level of, you know, interpretations and criticisms and whatnot. But yeah, I think like I asked myself that too. It's like if you if you built this thing out into more of a an interaction between those two characters, do you start to lose and start to wash out some of the concepts and styles that that sort of Lem is is more known for? Mm -hmm. And then are, are we basically asking the question of can you just write this book a completely different way for me? <laughs> Which I think has a little bit of like you know a little bit of pompous you know reader uh, <laughs> ego associated with it. Yeah. It's something I feel like everyone thinks about when they read, right? Am I the only one that thinks, okay, what, does this work better here? Would this be better somewhere else? I think, I, I think I'm a little bit better at just kind of like strapping myself in and like letting it be the thing that it is. But I think this one to me, because I think there was so much positive stuff that I got out of it, but I just didn't, I didn't feel super connected. And no point was it like, you know, the morning and I'm drinking my coffee and I'm just like, turning the pages of this novel and just being like super fucking stoked which is kind of how i define whether or not i like a book it's a very it's a very scientific uh metric um no, i but, think you, uh, you nailed it on the head there is <laughs> i think i ask myself those questions more if if i feel like there's something lacking then i start asking those questions but if i'm in the groove of reading i it never crosses my mind because i am being carried through that fictional dream in such a such a smooth way that I never stopped to ask. Yeah, exactly. So let me actually ask you a different question about interaction and sort of the emotional impact of that. Towards the end of the novel, when um, Kelvin goes down to Solaris for the first time and basically has that interaction with the ocean, for the ocean, it's this thing that it sort of does, I guess, somewhat mechanically, and then it's it's kind of over it. Basically, the ocean reaches out to kind of touch him, but it doesn't touch him. It just sort of goes around him and then it subsides and then Kelvin makes the comment or, or the observation that you know it would, it would take multiple hours to wait again for this thing to happen because it was kind of not a big deal for the ocean. I actually felt a little bit of like an emotional appeal to that because it really was what the novel was trying to build to. This whole attempted communication, maybe some level of closure towards what Kelvin had spent like a decade working on and, and aspiring to. And he had this short moment of at least something to, to hold on to. And it's interesting to me that that small moment of, you can call it contact or attempted contact, to me had more, more weight than his connection with Rhea throughout pretty much the whole book. Yeah. Because at least, at least I, get, I felt I was invested into that idea and it, it like built into something rather than was just kind of this flat, non-existent development between him and Rhea. Yeah. I had the same reaction. I think for two reasons. One, 
the narrative between him and Rhea is lackluster at best, but we get so much history of these people investing their lives into studying this planet. Right, We get the beginning, we get the middle, we get the end, we get that narrative flow. Even though it's wrapped in this academic Borgesian language, it's still there. And second, I think you have that reaction, or at least I had that reaction, because it was this culmination of this idea that, hey, maybe stop looking for answers somewhere else and start looking for answers within you. Even that this idea of like acceptance. And I know it sounds weird, but I find it calming when I think about how vast the universe is and how insignificant my own existence is, for some people <laughs> that's uncomfortable. I love that feeling. I love it. It's a way to sort of calm me down or center me. And Ooh, I think that's he, like some sixties pop size stuff. Right, right there. It is man. But uh, <laughs> I, I think he has that moment in some way, whether or not that makes him happy. It certainly makes him realize and sort of concludes his infatuation with this, this idea of contact. Yeah. I agree. I think that's a very soothing aspect, right? I mean, it's just like immediate, like if you, if you are so minuscule, any of your problems and any of your, you know, the, any of your stresses just are actually non-existent. They're not even negligible. They're, they're, they can't exist on a scale. And so I think you're right. Like for him, he had just been through such a psychological whirlwind over the previous, I don't know if it's months or what the time frame of the novel is, that just this sort of this bigger concept, this bigger thing that happened that was also kind of negligible. It was sort of forgettable, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then it happened, it just sort of, I don't know, framed everything. It gave everything the proper level of context. And maybe that's actually maybe that's actually the goal of this as we talk about it is is sort of if the question of this novel is, you know, how are you going to communicate with anything, whether it's someone or an entity, when you can't communicate with yourself, maybe the whole idea is, is establishing some level of context to put your own problems, your own memories, your own past, your own tragedies on the proper scale and to not let them be everything when maybe they're not everything. <laughs> well, do, I think do we, we just, yeah, <laughs> there you go, Lem, I, I, I fixed it for you. Um, <laughs> It was there all along, man. You just it was to, there. Oh man, it was, find that, it. that was the contact. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, the whole, the whole thing of like you're always looking for you're looking for yourself in other things as a form of connection. Mm -hmm. Which, in a weird way, we always talk about that when we read fiction. Which is, you know, does anyone just read fiction looking for characters that basically are a mirror of yourself back? in order as a, as a form of identification and a form of connection. Young readers, I think mostly do that. <laughs> I think I'm still doing it, right? Sometimes. I it's inevitable. We yeah. are ego driven. Yeah. But, you know, and there, there's quotes like this uh, in the novel. Uh, and I'll read one from the character Snow, where he just says, we don't want to conquer the cosmos. We simply want to extend the boundaries of Earth to the frontiers of the cosmos. For us, such and such a planet is as arid as the Sahara Another is frozen as the North Pole, yet another is lush as the Amazon basin. And so it's kind of, it's, it's playing off of that, you know, egocentric role of man in the universe. But I think it's also like a very uh, easy analogy for, you know, our egocentric roles in, in how we interact with the things around us, whether it's other people or society or art or, art or you know, just anything. We're just looking for ourselves. And maybe that's also part of the problem is, is that because we're so focused on ourselves that we actually can't see other things. And it also sort of distorts how we view ourselves as well. And so I think there's some layers in there too. Yeah. And it certainly keeps us in that perpetual cycle of continual reliving the same thing over and over again, staying in our confusion, staying in our whatever. Yeah, exactly. Your own thought loops and how difficult that can be, especially if they're sort of cycling around some sort of traumatic moment or event. Yeah. You're, you're nothing more than a record that a drunkard keeps playing yeah. as he feeds coins into the jukebox. Whew. Brutal. So now that we're super depressed on a Saturday morning. <laughs> <laughs> so is there is there hope in Solaris? Not in the planets, but in the novel? Uh, I think so. I, I guess I'm a person who sort of finds hope in reality in a way like if you characterize something properly and you define it for it is what it is it's sort of freeing it's not you know as much as i want to say depressing on a saturday morning it's actually awesome to have somebody say like hey like 
this whole theory of contact and communication with others and ourselves is flawed, but appreciate it because it's flawed. Find its benefits because it's flawed. Like, look at the good stuff. Don't just focus on the failures and don't just focus on, like, basically how how much you just want yourself to be in everything. So I think in a weird way, this this novel ends with a little bit of closure for the main character. And even though it's maybe not the most positive, I mean, the passage you read at the beginning, just about like, you know, the passage of time and, and just putting the coins in the jukebox till death is like, maybe not something that's going to go on a greeting card, (laughs) but like, uh, not yet. uh, Yeah. Not yet. Right. We'll see what 2019 looks like. Um, but, uh, I think I find a lot of positive stuff in that because I, I like that being characterized back to me. And so maybe that's just my, you know, inner psychology and, and what I look for in, in like books and, and ideas. But I think it's kind of soothing in a way. Yeah, I agree. I think it's important to know how unimportant you really are. How small we are. And thus, <laughs> thus your depression is even smaller. So who cares, man? Yeah. Enjoy it while you can. Yeah. Just, just go out in there and Touch those waves or don't touch those waves. Whatever you do, it's going to be repeated infinitely. Yeah. History repeats. There it is. <laughs> yeah. I'll just, just roll in all of your 60s pop side taglines. Yeah. We, we can bring in some Nietzsche, some Alan Watts. We'll have ourselves a, a sesh. Beautiful. Into it. And thus concludes uh, Lem's Therapy Hour. Thanks, Lem. Must I go on living here then, among the objects we both had touched, and the air she had breathed? In the name of what? In the hope of her return? I hoped for nothing, and yet I lived in expectation. Since she had gone, that was all that remained. I did not know what achievements, what mockery, even what torture still awaited me. I knew nothing, and I persisted in the faith that the time of cruel miracles was not past. So join us next time on the next episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast, where we'll be talking about the film adaptations of Solaris, both the 1972 and 2002 versions. Find us on the usual spots on the interwebs, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, booksofsomesubstance.com, and happy reading. Uh, Maybe we're not actually funny. Is that part of the problem?